Today, we're gonna to continue in our series on end time events, and we're gonna talk about the battle of Armageddon, the battle between good and evil, God and Satan, and you already know who's gonna win coming up. Hey, my friend, welcome back to The Beat. My name is Alan Parr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, it's a pleasure. If you want a free ebook, click the link in the description box below. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing. Hit that little bell notification so you won't miss a beat. Okay, so before we even get into the Battle of Armageddon, you may be asking a very important question. Why in the world do we need to even study end time events anyway? I mean, look, I'm st struggling in the present time, right? I'm just trying to make it from day to day. Why do I care about what's going on 2,000, maybe even a million years from now, right? Well, let me put it to you like this. One of the things that I love to do is I love to watch a good sporting event. And so oftentimes I'm not home to be able to watch it. So I record the event in hopes of being able to watch it later. And so I'm looking forward to getting home. I don't know who won. I'm, I'm looking forward to the suspense, the thrill of, of a last minute shot or a last second game buzzer beater or something like that. But every so often, somebody spoils it for me and tells me who won the game before I actually get a chance to watch it. Now, on one hand, I'm disappointed because I'm robbed of the opportunity to see how this game actually played out. On the other hand, if my team won, I'm happy because that relieves all the stress, all of the worry, all the doubt, and all the anxiety that I would experience if I was watching that game. Well, in the same way, whenever you and I already know who wins in the end, it can take away all sorts of anxiety in this life whenever we're facing different battles because we already know in the end who wins the war. So that's the reason why we want to study end time events. It gives us assurance that we we know that God is in control. And so in this video, I want to answer six questions about the battle of Armageddon. And the first question we want to ask is, when will this battle actually take place? And the Bible seems to be very clear that this battle of Armageddon is actually going to take place immediately following the last set of judgments. Now, if you've been following along in the series, you know that we have already done the seven seal judgments. We've already done the seven uh, uh, trumpet judgments. And then last week we came back into the seven bold judgments. Immediately after this seventh bold judgment, there is going to be a battle of Armageddon that's going to take place. And so the second question that we want to ask and answer is not only when will this battle occur, but why does there have to even be a battle of Armageddon in the first place? Well, the first thing that we need to understand is that even though God has already unleashed all of his judgments and punishments on the inhabitants of the earth, he still needs to dispose of these people and also the demonic powers that were responsible for this rebellion. And that is what's going to happen at the Battle of Armageddon. Notice here in verse 1 of chapter 19, it says, After this, I heard what sounded like a roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. So notice here that there's this heavenly host of people that are singing, as we used to sing in church, Hallelujah! salvation and glory because they're saying, God, it is about time that your justice is going to prevail. You are going to judge sin and death and punish all of the different demonic powers now that all of the judgments have passed. So basically at this judgment, God's justice against evil and sin and Satan and his henchmen themselves will finally be accomplished once and for all. Now we're going to get into some good questions. Who will actually be present at this battle of Armageddon? Now, if we go back to chapter 17, uh, we'll see here that there are a couple different groups of people that are going to be present. Now, if you remember in the last video, when the sixth bowl of judgment was poured out, the Bible says that the Euphrates River dried up so that it would make way for the kings to be able to travel through this dried up river and make their way to wage war against God's children chosen people in the city of Jerusalem. And so now notice what it says here. We get a little bit more information in chapter 17, verse 12. It says, the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. Now I don't have time to get into this, but basically John envisioned this beast 
that had 10 horns. And now uh, God is giving John the understanding or interpretation of that. And he's saying each horn on this beast's head represents a different nation. And all of these nations are going to now gather to try to wage war against God's chosen people in God's city, the city of Jerusalem. Notice it says here in verse 13, they have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. Now here it is, verse 14, they will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them. Why? Because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And notice now the second group that is going to be present at the battle of Armageddon, not only is Satan and his armies are going to be there and all the different rebellious people that are alive at this time, but also we as as the bride of Christ are going to be present fighting with Jesus himself in this battle of Armageddon. It says right here, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. My friend, you and I are going to be able to partner up and join up with Jesus Christ, our Savior, to be able to fight against the demonic powers that prevail. Now, as further proof that you and I are going to be present in this battle, I want you to go over to Revelation chapter 19 and look at verse 11. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Obviously, that is Jesus Christ himself. Notice it says, with justice, he judges and wages war. And then John goes on to explain this vision of Christ that he saw. It says, he looks like this. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed, now watch this now. He is dressed in a robe dipped with blood, which symbolizes victory in war. It says, and his name is the word of God. Now watch this. In verse 14, it says, the armies of heaven were following him. That is you and I. And it says here, we will be riding on white horses and also dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So we as believers will be present fighting in the battle of Armageddon with Jesus himself. Okay, the fourth question we want to ask and answer is where exactly is this battle going to take place geographically? Now, the Bible suggests that it's going to take place in the city of David in Jerusalem. Notice it says here in Revelation 16, verse 16, then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is actually a mixture of two words, Har Megiddo, which is located towards the northern border of the city of Jerusalem. Now, we don't have time to go here, but Joel actually suggests that this same battle is going to happen in what he calls the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That could even be that could either be a literal place or it could be figurative because the word Jehoshaphat means, interestingly enough, God judges. And so if it is a literal place, scholars do believe that this is now on the east side of Jerusalem. And then also in Isaiah, Isaiah says that there's going to be this battle that's going to take place in this city called Basra, which is a city in the region of Edom, which is actually on the southern part of Jerusalem. So basically the point is this, this battle is going to take place some 180 to 200 miles north and south and some 100 miles east and west, encompassing the entire city of Jerusalem. And the fifth and final question we want to ask and answer is what exactly is going to take place at this battle of Armageddon? Okay, so I got to warn you, you got to do some digging to actually get to the bottom of all of this. But if you go back to Zechariah, I know one of the books that we don't read, right? Zechariah chapter 14, it says here in verse one, a day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. Notice it says here, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. What does that sound like? It sounds like the same thing that John saw in the book of Revelation when he said, hey, this uh, this this uh, Euphrates River is going to dry up, allowing these kings to come and fight against and wage war against God's chosen people. This is the beauty of the word of God because it all comes together where one book complements and confirms what another book is actually saying. It says here, the city will be captured. So the first thing that we notice here in uh, the Battle of Armageddon is that Jerusalem is going to be captured temporarily and for a, just a short period of time. It says here, the houses will be ransacked and the women raped 
Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Now, notice the same exact thing that John saw in verse 3. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. So the first thing that we see that's going to happen in the Battle of Armageddon is God, for whatever reason, is going to allow his chosen people, the city, to be captured for a short period of time. But then he is going to go forward and fight for them. And now this leads me to the second major event that is going to take place in the Battle of Armageddon. Not only will Jerusalem be captured temporarily for a short season, but Jesus and his followers, that's you and I, are going to fight in this battle and destroy these other nations. Notice once again, I'm going to read the similar uh, passage that we read before, Revelation 19, verse 11, 12, 13, and 14. Looking at verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. Now notice how uh, John describes uh, this victory. It says here, he treads the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. So John compares this battle of Armageddon and the destruction and the slaughter that's going to take place to that of grapes that are being trampled in the wine press. So what we see here is that all of these pagan nations that rebelled against God, that refused to repent of their sins, are now going to be destroyed once and for all. But then the third thing that's going to happen is that the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be captured, and then they are going to be permanently disposed of, and God is going to cast them into the lake of fire. Remember I talked about last week how Satan has his version of an unholy trinity. He has Satan, and then we have the Antichrist who's trying to mimic Christ, and then you have the false prophet who is trying to mimic the Holy Spirit. Notice it says here in verse 19, then I saw saw the beast, that would be the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse, that's Jesus, and his army, that's you and I, but the beast, that's the Antichrist, was captured, and with it, the false prophet, that's the guy that's trying to mimic the Holy Spirit, who had performed the signs on its behalf, so he tries to be like the Holy Spirit and do signs and wonders, with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image, the two of them, that would be the Antichrist and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And then the last thing that's going to happen at this battle of Armageddon is actually a funny thing. Jesus is actually going to summon all the birds and let them know if you've been waiting for a smorgasbord, now is the time to get your fill and eat some flesh. Notice it says here in verse 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come, Gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Now, it picks up again in verse 21. It says here, the rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of the horse, that's Jesus Christ, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. So my friend, I hope this gives you a much clearer picture in terms of what exactly is going to happen at this event called the Battle of Armageddon. Stay tuned for next week as we continue in this series on end time events, and we're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I can't wait. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on The Beat.